بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So last week we were talking about the writing down of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and in it uh, Abu, uh, uh, in it we have uh, Suhail ibn Amr finally uh, agreeing with the demand of the Quraysh that whatever you do just make sure he doesn't come back next year and the rest they left it to Suhail so Suhail uh, as soon as the treaty begins, so uh, he <coughs> Bismillah, way too loud, lower, whatever you did, there was nobody asleep to that level, okay. Bismillah, testing. <laughs> Are you guys done? Yeah. Done playing around? <laughs> huh? You didn't do anything? No, you definitely did something. The, is this better now? Okay. Uh, so, Suhail ibn Amr, as we said, he had his own personal agenda. He's already lost one son. The other son is in his basement as he speaks. And it was the Qadr of Allah. Otherwise, the Quraysh did not put this condition on him. But no doubt they would like the condition. Right? So this condition, <coughs> excuse me, this condition is coming from him. And Suhail says that not a single man will come to you from us, even if he be upon your religion, except that you will return him to us. Right? So before they write this condition down, a number of people object before even it is written down. And they say, Subhanallah, how can we return one of ours to the mushrikun when he has chosen us as uh, a place of protection? And realize the bulk of the Sahaba had migrated from Makkah. If this condition had applied six years ago, there would not be Islam in Medina. Right? They feel this condition especially personally. They feel it. Because... Every one of the muhajir, this condition applies to them. And how many are the people, every few days somebody's migrating, fleeing from their family, fleeing from persecution, fleeing from torture, and the Muslims embrace him. So, if they were to implement this condition, the trickle of Muslims would be cut off completely. And there would not be now a surge of Islam. And no doubt this is a very big factor. We need quantity, we need quality. Additionally, there's the issue of helping innocent Muslims. They're being persecuted, they're coming to Medina, we need to protect them. So the Muslims find this condition to be very, very demeaning, very harsh. And before even it is written down, they are objecting to Suhail. And the very fact that they're objecting while the conditions are being said, it really shows how emotional this condition is. Because technically it's not their place to be speaking now, right? This is the process of them and Suhail. Technically it's not their place to be getting involved in the negotiation. But this shows us how emotional, how personal this condition was. And a number of them remarked, how can we, and maybe it was Umar ibn al-Khattab, because we will see later on that he really found this condition to be very problematic. He said, how can we return uh, a Muslim to the mushrikun when he has come to us as a Muslim? So Suhail insists, no, this is going to be the condition. And as I said, and there is no question, if you look at the timing and the context and everything, wallahi, this is uh, qadr Allah, you really cannot, it is simply too melodramatic. It's simply too much going on. Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to send the message clearly and that is right when they're discussing the condition it has yet to be written down perhaps five minutes are going back and forth between those who are objecting and Suhail who is insisting right then and there Abu Jandal who is the younger son of Suhail he's the one who uh, comes to the army of the Muslims his chains are still tied around his hands his torture marks the blood clearly visible uh, his upper chest is clearly exposed because he's being tortured he's being kept in a depraved condition for two to three years and no doubt he's figured out a way to escape but how where can he escape to so when he hears the Muslims are right outside the city now he realizes this is my chance I can escape right to the army because as I explained last week he can escape from the dungeon. You've probably figured out in two, three years how to escape. What's he going to do after that? Right? What's he going to do once he gets out in the streets of Mecca? How is he going to get to Medina? Where does he have the money, the ride? All of these are cut off. So when he hears that the Muslims are camped outside, now he realizes it is my golden opportunity and whatever his plan was that he had made in his mind for two, three years, he saw the conditions appropriate and he managed to flee and rushes out to Hudaybiyah right at the time when his father is negotiating with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he throws himself upon the Muslims and he calls out, O Muslims, help me, O Muslims, save me. And Suhail, of course, sees his own son in the distance. And he recognizes this is Abu Jandal. And Suhail turns to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, 
هَذَا الرَّجُلْ يَا مُحَمَّدْ This man, O Muhammad, is the first one that you shall return to us as per this condition. Obviously. This is his son, he's not going to let him go now. This is only son left, the other one's already in Mecca, in Medina. We're not going to let this one go. So the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, we haven't written down the conditions yet. We're still discussing them. Suhail said, if you refuse, then wallahi, no more conditions. Khalas, treaty is over. Because obviously this is his son. And again, had it been anybody else, maybe, right? But this is his son. If you refuse, then I will not agree with you anything ever after this. So the Prophet said, Habhuli, gift him to me. And then we'll start the condition after this. Just one gift, give him to me, and the rest will be, khalas, we'll implement it. And he said, La, I'm not going to gift him uh, to you. So the Prophet said, Bal ifal, just go ahead and do it. And in my reading of the seerah, I have never found a place where the Prophet is pleading multiple times the way that he was pleading for Abu Jandal, uh, the son of Suhail ibn Amr. Multiple times. He said, just make an exception for him. Just gift him to me. Just go ahead. Three, four times he's literally pleading with him to gift him Suha uh, Abu Jandal, uh, his own son. And of course, this is his father. And he said, kept on saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give him to you. This is the condition. Take it or leave it. And it seemed as if the entire uh, you know, treaty would basically go into a stalemate until finally Mikraz, who was Suhail's companion, you know, the one that uh, failed in the actual attempt. And the Prophet said, this is an evil man. He's not going to do any treaty with us. And he failed while he was having the um, discussion. Then uh, Suhail ibn Amr came. Mikraz said, okay, we will at least guarantee his safety from now on. In other words, okay, he'll remain with us, but he's not going to be tortured in this manner. Right? So, Mikraz, he has a role as well in this, and that is that he, when he saw the insistence of the Prophet ﷺ, he felt some type of deadlock that we need to break it, some impasse. So he said, okay, we will protect him uh, for you from now on. Right? Meaning he's not going to be persecuted. He's not going to come over to you, but we're going to make sure that he's not going to be tortured in this manner. So Abu Jandal is watching the entire proceedings. His father on one side and the Prophet on the other side. And it's clear that probably another 5-10 minutes goes by and the negotiations are against him. Abu Jandal cries out, O Muslims, will you return me to the mushriks while I have come to you as a Muslim? Now, put yourself in his shoes. For 3-4 years he's been building up the hope. When can I make my way to the Muslims? And in this meantime, he must have heard of at least a few dozen of the Sahaba made hijrah from Mecca to Medina and found safety in Medina. Right? It's happening. People leave all the time and they're still leaving to this time. And his dream, when can I get out and when can I get to Medina? When will I get safety and away from these change, chains? And subhanAllah, look at how he was tested. He freed himself from the chains. He made his way to the camp of the Muslims. And now he is being turned away. So he is now begging and pleading for his life. Will you return me after I have come to you? And I have sought your protection. Don't you see what they have done to me? Don't you see what they have done to me? And the narrator in Ibn Hisham in every single book says that the marks of torture were clear on him and the mushrikun had tortured him a severe torturing. So you can imagine the whips, the lashes, the chains, the emaciated body, the blood, clear that this man has been uh, tortured. And the Prophet ﷺ addressed him directly and he said, Isbir ya Aba Jandal, be patient, O Abu Jandal, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way and an exit out for you. Allah will make a way out for you. Be patient. And we see, we, we see here, subhanAllah, how persistent the Prophet was when he could not get it. At least he gave him that uh, consolation. And he said to him that uh, make sure that uh, you know uh, that you put your trust in Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will free you, insha'Allah ta'ala. Umar. When he saw this happening, and most likely it was Umar who said, how can we do this to them, O Messenger of Allah? How can we give them this condition? When he saw what was happening, he stood up. And he walked towards Abu Jandal. And he said to him that, be patient, O Abu Jandal. The same thing that the Prophet said. But then he said something very militant. He said, 
and realize that their blood is not worth anything. And as he said this, he pointed with his eyes to his sword. Umar had a sword, right? And he's pointing with his eyes that, look, here's the sword. Use it against... Now, he would have had to use it against his own father and against Mikras, right? We can't do anything because we are with this side. You have come from their city. If you were to, you know, get rid of them, that's your business and we're not going to get involved, basically, right? That's your job to do. So he gave him the opportunity by giving the ishara, giving him the green light that here's the sword, take it and do something with it, right? But for whatever reason, and most likely, uh, it appears it was simple psychology that in the end of the day, this is his father. In the end of the day, uh, he cannot, you know, do uh, such a deed. And so he did not take this opportunity. And uh, Abu Jandal was therefore put back into his chains and returned back to uh, Makkah. But the condition that Mikras has said he's not going to be tortured after that. And uh, other conditions were placed after this. Uh, of the conditions was that there would be a peace for 10 years. For 10 years, neither side would fight. And they said, uh, the, the, the exact phrase, they said, no armor and no swords, which is an Arabic phrase that means no fighting. No armor and no swords between the two between the two sides. And the conditions came that both of the two sides can engage with treaties with any other entity. Both Quraysh and the Muslims can engage with treaties with any tribe that wants to enter into alliances. And if any tribe entered with the Muslims, all of these conditions must apply to them. And if any tribe entered with the Quraysh, all of these conditions will also apply to them. So there is now this, this uh, sense of political separation, political entity being established. You have the right to negotiate fully and legitimately with any other group, and we also retain this right. And of the uh, conditions was that when the Prophet ﷺ said, we will be performing Umrah, the first thing Suhail said, أَمَّ هَذَا الْعَامْ فَلَا as for this year, then no. Let not the Arabs say that you had the upper hand over us. That shall be next year. And this was, of course, another blow for the uh, eagerness of the Muslims. They've been marching, you know, for a, a week and a half. Now they've been camped out here for so many days. Another blow. It's not going to be this year. It's going to be next year. And when you come next year, you tell us, and we will give you three days to vacate the city. You will do what you want, and then you will leave, and we will come back to the uh, city. And, of course, we already said that of the conditions was that if any Muslim were to come uh, uh, rejecting the people of Mecca and going to Medina, he will be returned. If any man per did this, he will be returned. However, if any Muslim came to Mecca after having rejected Islam and returning to the ways of their forefathers, he too shall not be returned. So it's clearly a one-way street, right? Clearly, the Quraysh are demanding something that is not fair. We're not going to do to you what we want you to do to us. We will not return your people but you will return our people. Mm. And clearly this is a slap in the face. Anyone who is neutral will, will realize the arrogance of the Quraysh here. And can you imagine the anger of the Muslims in this regard as well? And this is exactly what uh, happened. And we already mentioned that it was Ali who wrote the contract. And uh, except for one, one uh, phrase where it is said that the Prophet ﷺ took it and uh, erased it himself and according to one version of Bukhari it says that he wrote it we'll come, we'll come back to this version and what it means and both of the sides had their witnesses on the side of the Muslims there was Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali all of them were witnesses all of the four Khulafa al Rashidun were witnesses on the side of uh, the Quraysh there was a delegation Mikras and Suhaid and there was one or two other people from the Quraysh all of them were witnesses to this uh, covenant now before we move on whatever Whatever negatives that we will feel at this point in time, and before even we talk about any other positive, the one biggest positive that is clearly occurring is that for the very first time, the Muslims are being treated as an independent, powerful, political entity. No matter what you want to say, and we feel anger, and the Sahaba's anger was much more than ours, obviously a million times more, but clearly for the first time, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Muslims and the Quraysh are 
on the same table. They're on the same negotiation level. Because you don't write a treaty except with an equal. And the fact that the Quraysh are forced to write such a treaty, the Muslims have been upgraded now. After all of these battles and all of this, finally the Muslims are being given the respect and the izzah of being a separate political entity. So much so, in fact, and this is another point of the Hudaybiyyah, that notice, on one side you have a religious identity, Muslims. On the other side you have a tribal slash ethnic identity, Quraysh. And we see here the beginnings of the real split between Islam and paganism. That in Islam, what really ties you together is what? Your religion. It is more powerful than the ties of kinship, the ties of nation-state, the ties of tribalism. Whereas in every other society, including the society we are living in, there are things that trump your religion, that are more important than religion. And for the Quraysh, it was the tribe. So, even though they're two different entities, the nature of every entity is very different, if you understand what I'm saying here. The one is a religious entity, the Ummah, and the other is a ethnic entity, and that is the Quraysh and those who uh, undertake an alliance with them. And then the clause that says, whoever wants to can undertake a treaty with the Muslims, whoever wants to can undertake, undertake a treaty with the Quraysh. What is happening here? The entire Arabian Peninsula is being divided into two. Islam and Kufr. This is the precursor to the Fatih Mecca. It is the precursor to the conquest of all of Arabia. Right? That it's not just Quraysh versus another tribe of Quraysh or another, the Banu Hashim, which again in the beginnings of Mecca, it was the Banu Hashim versus the Quraysh, remember, right? The Sha'ab of Abi Talib and the boycott and all that. In the beginnings of Islam, it was really uh, something that was relatively small. Slowly but surely, the entire Arabian Peninsula and the Arab race is being dragged in until finally, and this is amazing, within a few years, paganism will be wiped out from the face of the, at least the Arabian earth. Right? There are no more Arabs who worship idols. Think about that. Right? How the Arabs were and then what happened. And this is now the camp being divided. On the one side, Islam. On the other side, idolatry, paganism, jahiliya, ethnicity, tribalism. All of this is being represented. Right? So for the first time, people have to make up their minds, which side of the coin are you on? And this is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, is the precursor to this division and split. So, Suhail then returns back happy and content. They have their conditions. The Quraysh have their conditions. Suhail has his uh, conditions. At this, Umar radiallahu ta'ala he was the one who verbalized what was in the minds of many Muslims. And he came up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him a series of rhetorical questions. And as we have already said so many times, a rhetorical question is said to emphasize that which you already know. It is said to emphasize the known. He said, are you not the messenger of Allah? Alasta Rasulullah. Are you not the messenger of Allah? The Prophet said, bala. He said, are we not upon the truth and our enemies upon the batil, upon the misguidance? He said, bala. Yes. So then Umar said, then how can we accept the lower hand, the humiliation, a daniyata being disgraced in our religion? How could we have allowed them to trample over us like this? We came here basically wanting, I'm, I'm extrapolating, the version only says, how could we accept humiliation? But put yourself in the shoes of the Sahaba now, how they're feeling. The majority of them, they're feeling very much angry at the Quraysh. They're feeling let down at the Quraysh. How could the Quraysh have done this to us? And why did we accept these conditions? We should have refused. Why do we have to say yes when we are coming in peace? We have been waiting here for two, three weeks, you know, outside camp, outside Mecca. It's taken us 10 days to get here, right? An entire month must have gone by minimum for all of this to go on. We're tired, we're hungry, we're you know, away from home. We just want to go to the Kaaba. And we've been stopped. Additionally, now we have all of these other conditions that we weren't even expecting. No more Muslims come to us. We have to return every Muslim back to them. And they get to keep anyone. Not that there's a threat, but it's an emotional factor. Not that there were any people who left Medina to go to Mecca. That didn't happen. But it's an emotional factor. Why should we allow ours to go to them and they will not be coming to us? And the Prophet wasallam said, I am the Rasul of Allah. I am the Messenger of Allah. And I will not disobey Allah. And He will help me. 
meaning that I don't know what to tell you other than this was what I was commanded to do. I don't know what else to tell you. I don't know where, where this is leading. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me, this is the intent here. Allah azza wa has told me to accept these conditions and I will not disobey him. And Allah will help me. How? I don't know. But Allah azza wa will help me. And this is a solid response. How are you going to respond to this? This tactic is basically a very solid response. And that is Allah azza wa will help me. Umar cannot argue here. So Umar then backtracks and attempts a new line of reasoning. This is a dead end now. He said, Allah will help me. Khalas, that's true. Let's go back. So try another tactic. Ya Rasulullah, didn't you tell us that we will be doing tawaf around the house of Allah? This is another tactic now. Okay, that's not working. Let me try another thing. You told us, Ya Rasulullah, when we were in Medina, that come with me and we will do tawaf around the house. And obviously we're not going to do tawaf now. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed, I told you. But did I say you will do it this year? Omar said, no. So the Prophet said, then you will do it next year. My vision will come true. You will do it. But I didn't tell you this year. And I, I saw the dream. Allah didn't tell me which year. I assumed it's this year. Now we find out it is next year. So you will come back to the house and you will perform tawaf around it. Now, here we see that Umar's anger, his ghira, is for the religion of Islam. He is feeling angry because he feels Islam has been trampled on. He feels the religion of Islam has been given the shorter end. They've been short-changed because of the Quraysh. And his ghira or his anger is not coming out of a Astaghfirullah Jahilist, out of anything, it's coming for the religion of Islam. However, it is clear that he made a, an error and a mistake, and that he surpassed what is legitimate, because the Prophet represents Islam completely, and Umar does not represent Islam. And emotions make a man do things that he, they will, he, he or she will regret, and that is why our Prophet when the man came to him and said, advise me, he said, la taghdab, don't get angry. He said, advise me more, don't get angry, don't get angry, don't get angry. Because in anger, a man does what a man later regrets. Anger is that one emotion that whenever you act upon it, you will later regret it. And Umar ibn Khattab definitely acted out of anger. And even though the base of that anger was coming from Iman, this is a very important point here. Why was he angry? That his own ego was hurt? Why was he angry? That Jahili customs were trampled on? No, he was angry because he felt that the religion of Islam had got the short change. That the religion of Islam had been humiliated by the Quraysh and he wants to know what he can do about it. No doubt he went beyond his bounds and he himself realized this. Not yet though. He needs somebody else to put him in place. And what man is there that can put Umar ibn al-Khattab in place? None other than Abu Bakr. So he goes to Abu Bakr. And the very fact that he goes to Abu Bakr number two shows us the rank of Abu Bakr. Out of all of the Sahaba, even Umar knew that here is a man that I can express after the process of who should I go to. And he asked him the exact same questions. That are we not upon the truth? Yes. And is he not the messenger of Allah? Yes. Then how can we accept humiliation in our religion? At this Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, he got angry at Umar. And he said to him, Ya Rajul. And that is a very harsh thing to say. That, oh man, hey, you, Ya Rajul, watch out. He is the messenger of Allah. Meaning, who are you to say these types of things? He is the messenger of Allah. And he will not disobey his Lord. So you hang on to the stirrup of his saddle i.e. put yourself at your place, right? You hang on to the stirrup of his saddle. You know the saddle on top of the camel. You hold on to the bottom of that. Otherwise, there is no salvation or there's no uh, hope for you. And we clearly see here that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, without uh, the Prophet speaking with him, he already has analyzed all of these things in his head. And he has no issues accepting what has happened. And this clearly shows the superiority of Abu Bakr over Umar. That Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala 
even though no doubt he's also hurt, he's also, you know, angry, but he understands there must be something I don't know. Allah knows, and his messenger knows, and I do not know. And he said the exact same thing to Umar, that yes, indeed, he said we would pray, uh, we would do tawaf, but did he say we would do it this year? No, so then we will do it next year. We will come back and do it and perform it. And this shows us the correspondence of what Abu Bakr says to what the Prophet ﷺ says. Without the Prophet ﷺ telling Abu Bakr these things, it clearly shows shows us Abu Bakr's fiqh, Abu Bakr's understanding. And we also see over here a side of Abu Bakr that is generally overlooked. Our image of Abu Bakr is a extra polite, crying, humble, soft man. And this is valid. But there is a side of him that comes out when he is provoked. And we have already seen this in Hudaybiyah. He's the one who gave the vile and vulgar threat. Something we could never imagine Abu Bakr to say. And now when Umar's coming to him, he tells him, Ya Rajul, oh man, calm down, what are you doing? And he puts Umar in his place. And when and, and of course he would do this later on at the death of the Prophet as well. When Umar emotionally, he really he did lose it. And emotionally, and wallahi, he has every right to lose it at that time. When the Prophet passes away, Umar cannot fathom it. He cannot imagine a world without Rasulullah It is Abu Bakr that puts him in his place. It is Abu Bakr that quotes him the verse, Umar says, as if Abu Bakr cut my two legs from underneath me, right? Nobody has the audacity to speak to Umar except Abu Bakr. What does that show? That no doubt Abu Bakr is soft and crying and gentle and humble and meek. But when push comes to shove, when a man needs to be a man, nobody beats Abu Bakr as well, including Umar. And this is the fiqh and this is the superiority of Umar over, of Abu Bakr over Umar. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala he himself later said that فَفَعَلْتُ لِذَلِكَ أَعْمَالًا I, After this, I continued to perform good deeds hoping that Allah would forgive me for what I had done. And it is said that he gave so many slaves and um, uh, freed so many slaves. He fasted so many days. He uh, uh, prayed so many nights. Meaning, he realized he had done more than he should have even though it's an act of emotion and Allah Azza wa Jal and he has forgiven these types of emotional outbursts but he realized that he had gone beyond what was appropriate and he said I made that up I continue to do things until I feel that I had made it up and we see here the confusion of Umar ibn Khattab his disappointment he later remarked uh, during his Khilafah to those around him he said that on the day of Hudaybiyah the Prophet put a condition on us if any other leader had put it on me, I would never have accepted it. So he's being frank here. That if any other leader had told me that I have to give up Muslims and hand them back to the, the pagans who are torturing them, I would never have accepted this. He cannot understand this except that it is coming from the Prophet wasallam. Also, Umar was not alone. No doubt Umar was the only one who went directly to the Prophet but the frustration and anger was common. And we have another Sahabi, uh, Sahal ibn Hanif, a very well-known Sahabi. Sahal ibn Hanif, many years later, in the Battle of Safin, when the Muslims were once again lined up to fight, uh, this time other Muslims, uh, he's trying to calm them down. And he says, O people, O people, ayyuhan nas, always find your own opinions blameworthy over the Quran and Sunnah. Meaning, accuse your own opinions before you accuse the Qur'an and Sunnah. Accuse your own positions before you accuse the Qur'an and Sunnah. Verily, I remember myself on the day of Abu Jandal. Notice, he didn't even call it the day of Hudaybiyah. Yawma Abi Jandal. Can you imagine the emotional trauma, the shock to see this man being tortured, throwing himself to the Muslims, in front of their eyes he's taken away. The Sahaba would rather have died in battle defending Abu Jandal than willingly, meekly hand him back and go back to Medina. This is their iman here. How can we just hand him back? So the whole day has been called Yawma Abi Jandal. And Sahal ibn Hanif says, I saw myself, I remember myself on the day of Abu Jandal. If I could have rejected the command of the Prophet ﷺ, I would have done so. This is an amazing, amazing, amazing quote. Sahal ibn Hanif is one of the famous Sahaba. He is known for his piety, his taqwa, 
and many years later he confesses something to another group. Why is he opening up here? Because the Battle of Safin was a very traumatic battle, and people were, uh, as you know, gonna, the, a war was just about to be you know, uh, launched between Muawiyah and uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and uh, there was very, a lot of tension in the camps, and Sahel wanted to calm them down and basically say, look, follow the Quran and Sunnah even if you don't understand it. Avoid the bloodshed, just obey Allah and His Messenger. You know, obey the ahadith of not fighting this and that. No matter how sure you think you are, accuse your own opinions before you accuse the Quran and Sunnah. Your own ra'i, make ittiham of that. Make, accuse your own opinion before you accuse the religion. Wallahi, that quote needs to be memorized by all of us, especially in this time where everybody's opinion holds more weight than what the Prophet himself said, right? Where everybody thinks, oh, I understand this, I know this better, right? So much so that, <laughs> astaghfirullah, one time in my life, I'll never forget, I uh, met one of these, these uh, Qur'aniyun, these Munkar, uh, you know, the ones who reject Hadith, right? Wallahi, what he said, it, uh, it made me almost and lose my consciousness at him in, in, in anger and whatnot when I quoted him a hadith he said that was the opinion of Muhammad I mean just like mind boggling you know that was his opinion you don't have to quote me his opinion wallahi this is kufr there's no two questions there's no two ways about it right if you're gonna do this and he just say ah that's his opinion I have my opinion right and this is wallahi it is kufr there's no two ways about this right my point being this type of attitude even though alhamdulillah none of us have it explicitly, yet it is common in the ummah that when we're quoted a hadith, when we're quoted a, a verse of the Quran, we think yani, we should know better than this. We don't have to take this exact hadith and this is not the spirit of Islam. We hear and we obey and this is what uh, Sahal ibn Hanif is saying that accuse your own interpretations before you accuse the Quran and Sunnah. Accuse your own opinions before you accuse the Quran and Sunnah because I was about to reject the command of the Prophet because I felt it to be wrong. And if I could have done it and gotten away, I would have done it. Right? And this shows us, of course, later on, he himself realized that Hudaybiyah was a victory. He himself realized this was the best thing to do. But at the time, he couldn't see that. And at the time, he could only see one thing, and that is, we have lost. We have accepted humility. This is not Umar, this is Sahal. So the point is, this sentiment was not alone with Umar. There were many other Sahaba who felt the same sentiment as well. No doubt we also see over here that uh, a very important uh, lesson in making up one's transgressions. Umar made a mistake. He said, فَفَعَلْتُ لِذَلِكَ أَعْمَالًا I made it up by doing good deeds. And this shows us the sins that we do. The best way to make up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best way to come closer to Allah is to increase our good deeds. And that is why real tawbah, real tawbah will bring about extra actions. It's easy to say, Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. But real tawbah will bring about a change in lifestyle and change in actions. Allah says in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Except who repents and believes and does righteous deeds. وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا So he linked عَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا to tawbah. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And this is what Umar himself understood. I made a mistake, I needed to make it up by doing a lot of good deeds after that. And the same applies to any mistake that we have done. Also another very interesting thing that we learn over here. No doubt what Umar did was beyond what was exactly appropriate, right? Now, I have to say before we move on, that the other group, uh, the non-Sunni group, they use this type of stuff and they say, they say about Umar what they say. But this is ludicrous because Umar's anger was a misjudgment of an Islamic anger. In other words, his anger is not personal. His anger is not coming from his own ego. His anger is not, I'm not going to listen to you, which is what Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul said in the battle of Uhud. Why should we listen to you? You didn't listen to me. That is nifaq and kufr. As for Umar's emotions, there is no doubt, we all agree, he agrees that he went beyond the browns, right? We're not making any excuse that his adab was not the best, that his anger got the better of him. And he made a mistake, but the mistake was a mistake of emotion, not a mistake of kibber or arrogance, number one. 
And in a mistake of emotion, everybody makes it. And you are forgiven for making it like the man who finds his camel lost in the desert and he utters a statement of kufr, right? He's forgiven because of his emotion. And as soon as Umar's emotions got the better of him, sorry, as soon as his emotions calmed down and he got the better of his emotions, he realized, right? So this is an emotional outburst. Number two, where do those emotions come from? From the love of Islam. No doubt, misinterpretation, because you cannot love Islam more than the Prophet right? But the point is, his emotions came from an anger for the sake of Islam. We need to take this into account, right? So the other group really has no evidence whatsoever, and the clear fact, neither the Prophet nor Abu Bakr nor any of the Sahaba held this against him. They understood that his emotions got the better of him. They understood these emotions to be stemming from Islamic anger, and so they let it be. He himself uh, made up for it with his own deeds. But the point here, a very important lesson that is demonstrated by this outburst and by the process in responding back to him and defending himself. A very important lesson, and that is objecting to, even arguing with respect with the leader, is something that the Sharia allows. Bringing another point of view, trying to see your position. And no doubt, I'm not going to claim here that Islam has freedom of expression. It doesn't have freedom of expression the way that Western society does. You cannot make fun of Allah and His Messenger. There's a line that is to be drawn. But you can criticize and give other positions to the rulers. It's not as if you just have to acquiesce and agree. Now, if they insist, you must follow the rulers legitimately. A legitimate ruler. But you have the freedom to disagree. You have the freedom to bring another position, to argue a point back and forth. Umar's arguing three, four different tactics. And if this is being done with Rasulullah how about somebody who is not to that level? And this clearly demonstrates, and this is in contrast to what some of the more extreme, hardcore, ultra-conservative movements say, that whatever the wali al-amr says, khalas sami'na wa ta'na. No, ultimate sami'na wa ta'na is only to Allah and His Messenger. Ultimate. As for the wali al-amr or the person in charge or the khalifa or whatever, no doubt if it's a legitimate khalifa and he insists you to do something halal, you must follow. But you have the right to go back and forth. And this is demonstrated in Umar ibn Khattab's own uh, attempts with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So now that this is over And uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab clearly understands That he was at fault And the Sahaba have to wrap up their bags The Prophet Sallallahu basically said Qumu, stand up, shave your heads And basically let's return Now this obviously was such an Anti-climactic ending After having been built up that inshallah finally we'll have a big breakthrough, finally we'll be able to go to the Kaaba, finally Suhail's coming, everything will be made easy for us. Instead, they're told, khalas, end of story, let's shave and let's go back. And the Sahaba were so depressed that the only time in the whole seerah, as far as I know, nobody had the heart to implement what the Prophet said. In my humble reading, I haven't found any other instance in the whole seerah like this. And this really shows us how traumatized they were. One thing after another is happening. One, from their perspective, humiliation after another. And now finally, shave your hairs and go. Now, by the way, this is something new in the Sharia. Pre-Islam didn't have it. And that is, if you cannot go to the Kaaba and you're stuck and you have to, you stop, khalas, you get out of your ihram, you shave your hair wherever you are, and you return. Now, the Muslims had never heard this. This is the first time it's ever happening. It is now a standard part of our sharia, by the way, right? If any of us, may Allah protect all of us, if any of us are prevented from going to the haram, whatever happens, whether it's a political thing, and by the way, throughout Islamic history, so many times there were political crises, the pilgrims had to return home, or pilgrims from one country had to return home, right? Or it's an economic crisis, or it's a plague, or whatever is happening, and the road is blocked, whatever, and you cannot make it, you cannot do it. What do you do? This is what you do. Wherever you're stopped, wherever you're stuck, and you know you cannot make it in time for Hajj, or uh, if it's an Umrah and you cannot go on for whatever reason, then you will basically shave there, sacrifice your camels there, get out of Ihram right then and there, and then you will make it up later on. As the Muslims did. Right? That's exactly what the Muslims did. Now this ruling was new. They had never heard of it before. Why had they never heard of it? Because when would they apply it? Right? This is the only time they applied it themselves. And this is the only time in the history of the Prophet, in the seerah, that it is applied, that he didn't actually make it to the Kaaba. Right? 
And so he told them, shave your hair, do your udhiyah, and let's go back and return. So not only is it anticlimactic, not only is it a lack of izah humiliation, now this is a ruling that really is bizarre. These animals were meant for the Kaaba. Our ihram is not going to be removed until we do tawaf and sa'i. This was their understanding, and it is the general rule. Now they're being told, don't worry about it. Khalas, it's done. Shave off your hair, sacrifice your camels, get out of your ihram, wear your regular clothes, we're going back home. And the shock was so much, and this is understandable as well, completely. And also another thing is when no single person is being commanded, and all of them simply sit there, there is this, you know, complacency with the mob. When the mob does it, I'll also do it, right? No one person is being singled out. When everybody's immobile, so then everybody remains immobile, right? When nobody's standing up, khalas, I'm not standing up either. And the Prophet repeated this a second time, and nobody moves. He repeated it a third time, and nobody moves. And clearly, the tension is great here. And the Prophet then returns back to his tent. And Umm Salama is in his tent. Umm Salama is in his tent. And the Prophet is visibly agitated and he confides in Umm Salama that I commanded them to shave their head and not one of them responded to me. So Umm Salama said, do you wish that they follow you, O Messenger of Allah? He said, yes. So she said, then why don't you show them you're doing it when they see you doing it, they will follow you. And subhanAllah, some basic human psychology. Basic human psychology. And the Prophet ﷺ took the advice of Umm Salama and he went outside. He called for his barber. There was a Sahabi that was known for basically trimming and shaving hair. He called for his barber and he shaved his hair off in front of everyone. And when the Sahaba saw him shaving his hair off and they realized that khalas, this is it now and he's doing it. So when he started doing it, then they started calling for each other to shave their hairs off until finally everybody was yaqtatilu and they were fighting one another. And this is, happens every time when we do our, ourselves do hajj. You're fighting for the barber. Who's going to be next? I'm going to be next. I'm going to be the one, right? This is anybody who's done hajj knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, barbers are a scarcity that day and mashallah, everybody becomes a barber as well, which is a very dangerous thing on that day. Do not ever do a first time barber on your own hair. Uh, you can do it on his but don't let him do it on you, okay? So that everybody's now fighting to make the, uh, the to shave their hair off and it was here as well that the Prophet uh, made dua for those who shaved their hair off and he said, may Allah Azza wa have mercy on the muhalliqeen and some of them had only trimmed their hair. So they said, and those who cut so he said, well, second time, may Allah have mercy on those who shave so the ones who trim said, and those who cut for the third time, he said, may Allah have mercy on those who shave. When, the, when he said for the fourth time, when they said, and those who cut. So the fourth time he said, and those who cut as well. And from this, the scholars have derived the famous ruling that we have all covered in the fiqh of Hajj and Umrah so many times. And that is that shaving is much more rewarded than trimming. Shaving is much more rewarded than trimming. And that's because the Prophet made dua three times for those who shaved. And two times, uh, sorry, once for those who uh, trimmed. So... With this, the animals were sacrificed and uh, it is said that the meat was still sent to Mecca. And subhanAllah, look at the Quraysh, they will accept the meat, right? But they will not accept the uh, Muslims. And it is also said that the first camel that the Prophet ﷺ sent was Abu Lahab's camel, which he had conquered or had captured in the Battle of Badr. Somebody was riding it and he sent... Uh, Sorry, not Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl. Abu, Abu Jahl was not in the Battle of Badr. Abu Jahl was in the Battle of Badr. Abu Lahab died in Mecca. Abu Jahl's camel. That they had, they had conquered, not conquered, they had captured, they had confiscated the camel of uh, Abu Jahl. And it was a well-known camel. Obviously, Abu Jahl will ex, uh, you know, afford the most expensive and whatnot. And those days, they recognized camels, by the way. You know, I mean, they, like, not like us, everybody, everything looks the same. They recognized camels, right? So the, the first camel that he sent was the camel of Abu Jahl. And this is no doubt any psychological tactic as well. And this was uh, painful for the Quraysh that this is the camel that is being sent to them. Uh, nonetheless, so the Prophet ﷺ shaved his hair and sacrificed the camels. And then they're on the way back. And on the way back to Medina, Umar obviously feels greatly troubled by what he has done. And finally, when he calms down and his uh, senses return to him, he realizes he needs to apologize. He needs to make up to the Prophet ﷺ. So... 
he rides up to the camel of the Prophet Sallallahu and tries to engage in conversation. Says Salam. But there's no response. Says Salam for a second time. No response. As if there's being ignored. Says Salam for the third time. And that's the maximum you're supposed to say. As you know, you're only supposed to ask three times. And there's no response. And so Umar thought the worst. That khalas. I am now finished. And he said to himself, he narrates later on, he says to himself, let Umar's mother mourn the loss of her son. Let my mother start crying over me now. Khalas, I am gone. And he thought that because of his deeds now, yani he has lost uh, any chance at salvation or mercy. Uh, and it appears that his fears seem to be confirmed by a rider who came up to him and said, the process is calling you. Khalas, now this is it. I'm going to end now everything, right? So he rides up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sees the Prophet's face beaming with joy. Just light coming out of it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started reciting the famous chapters of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatih, that A'udhu Billahi Minash Rajim Bismillah Ar Rahim, Inna Fatahna Laka Fatham Mubina. And he recited and the entire Surah Al-Fatih was revealed at this point in time. It was a one singular Surah that came down. And Surah Al-Fatih is one, two, uh, three and a half pages. No, one, two, three, four and a half pages. Surah Al-Fatih has four and a half pages. And the whole Surah came down at that particular point in time. And the beginning of it summarizes the entire Surah. And inshallah next Wednesday, we'll quickly go over some of the main verses of Surah Al-Fatih as, as is our custom, as you know. I always want to go over the Quran uh, when, we, when the Quran is revealed about the Seerah so that we appreciate for the rest of our lives. Whenever we read Surah Al-Fatih, we should link every ayah to exactly what it is referencing. And inshallah, I hope you understand this is lengthy, but no doubt I think it is very important that we link the Quran directly to the Seerah. And that is Inshallah, we'll do the first uh, you know, 20 minutes inshallah, of next week before we move on. Uh, and so the beginning of the surah summarizes it. Inna we have surely given you the biggest victory. This is fatham mubina, a clear victory. There's no doubt about this victory. And so Umar said, Afathun huwa ya Rasulullah. Is this a victory? The, he's asking, is this a victory? And the Prophet said, e wallahi, it is a victory. And so Umar said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And he began racing with his camel up and down the lines of the Muslims saying, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Allah has given us the biggest victory. And our Prophet praised the surah and he said, Allah has sent down a surah that is more beloved to me than everything on this earth. In other words, the surah cheered him up more than anything on this earth could cheer him up. And uh, the, uh, the Surah Al-Fatih, of course, it predicts so many things. We'll talk about that in, uh, next week. But it predicts the forgiveness of the Sahaba. That Allah Azza wa will give them Jannat and Tajim Tahti al Anhar. One of the main themes of the surah is praising the Sahaba. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Right? And the very last verse, Muhammadur Rasulullah وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ Those that are with him. And then Allah praises them in the Quran. He gives one of the most poetic examples of the Sahaba. Right? Allah compares the Sahaba to a beautiful tree that has been planted by the farmer and the farmer is happy at what he has seen from this tree and the farmer in this, in this instance is the Prophet and planting the Sahaba and, the, and he is happy at what the uh, Sahaba have done in that no matter it was a very difficult test but in the end they did pass it no matter it was difficult they were emotional but in the end when push came to shove they followed through Right? And it is impossible to imagine any other group following their leader in such a difficult circumstance. Firstly with the Bayat al-Ridwan and then with the emotional and then Abu Jandal, all of this, they're simply following along. And so Allah praises the Sahaba throughout Surah Al-Fatih and Allah blesses them with a great promise of forgiveness and وَمَغَانِمَ كَثِيرًا تَنْتَأْخُذُونَهَا You will sh uh, shortly gain a lot of war booty. وَمَغَانِمَ كَثِيرَةً تَأْخُذُونَهَا You shortly gain a large victory. And of course that victory, they didn't know it at the time. It was going to be the battle of Khaybar, which is going to be our next major battle in two weeks. InshaAllah Ta'ala will discuss that. So, Surah Al-Fatih was revealed and the Muslims, all of them, their attitude changed from being depressed, from being gloomy, to 
understanding this was a victory and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, that. And in this there is a very controversial theological point. It's not easy to say this, but it must be said. It's a very controversial point and we have had discussions of, about this in this masjid as well. The fact that the Sahaba psychology changed instantaneously at the revelation of Surah Al-Fatih. First and foremost was Umar. Notice Umar's 180 degree turn. Is it a Fatah? E wallahi. Allahu Akbar. Inna fatahna ka fatah mubina. Instantaneous 180 degree turn. This clearly demonstrates for us that they realized the humanity of the Prophet ﷺ and the infallibility of Allah's wahi. Because the whole point they were worried this may be not coming from Allah directly. This is your ijtihad. And that's why they were feeling this isn't the best. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms it. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. And this is a very controversial point, even as we said in this masjid, there's some back and forth that took place, that the Prophet ﷺ was allowed ijtihad by Allah, as we had said. And that ijtihad is binding on the ummah, regardless of whether it is binding on the ummah. Whatever it comes from, we have to follow it. But the Sahaba simply felt that maybe, you know, even though we're going to follow it, and they did follow it, but maybe there's something we didn't understand. Maybe there could have been a better uh, option or whatnot. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No, this was inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. The change of psychology, especially of Umar instantaneously, it clearly demonstrates this theological point that we have said so many times throughout the seerah. And that is, ijtihad of the Prophet ﷺ is something Allah allowed him to do. And his ijtihad, if Allah approved it, it was silence. And if Allah wanted to change it or, 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 or do something else, Wahi would come down and he would change it. And this is what we see throughout the seerah and this incident proves that as well. So the Sahaba returned uh, back to the, uh, the city of Medina and most likely uh, they stayed in uh, Hudaybiyah for around 20 days. Ibn uh, Al-Waqidi says 20 days and Ibn Sa'd as well says around 20 days they stayed. So back and forth between the Quraysh and the Muslims for 20 days and the entire trip lasted them a month and a half. So the entire trip from beginning to end, they left Medina, they came back after uh, six weeks. And when they returned back to Medina, the first incident occurred that will test this treaty. And that is Abu Basir. Abu Basir's story is a very quick and interesting story. Abu Basir was... Uh, somebody who lived in Mecca, he was not uh, Qurashi, he was from Khuza'a, but he's living in Mecca. And he's basically a part of the, basically the tribes now have associated with Mecca, and his tribe is associated with Mecca. Abu Basir is the first muhajir after Hudaybiyah to make his hijrah to Medina. And Abu Basir comes, and the Prophet ﷺ does not say anything, he's in, this, he's in the city. After two, three days, the Quraysh or the Khuza'a basically send the two emissaries, two emissaries, and they say, hand us back Abu Basir. According to the treaty, hand us back Abu Basir. We have a treaty, you agreed. So the Prophet called Abu Basir and he said to him, these two men have come to take you and you came knowing the treaty that we signed and I will not be treacherous. So return to your people. Now, notice here, Abu Basir and everybody in the world knows the treaty. Abu Basir feels, come on, you're not really going to do this, right? So he risks it. He leaves Mecca, he goes all the way to Medina. And notice here, when he comes, the Prophet ﷺ does not turn him away. Why? And we're going to see this over and over again. Because the Prophet ﷺ is following the letter and not the spirit of the contract over here. He's following the letter of the contract. The letter of the contract did not say you have to return the person. The enforcement of the contract is not up to you. You don't have to patrol Medina and make sure people go away. The enforcement is open. So the Quraysh come for the enforcement. And when they come, he says, okay, you've come, then okay, he's yours. I can't protect you from them. Notice here, right? So if they had not come, it's not my job to enforce. 
You didn't tell me I have to enforce. And so Abu Basir is living for a few days. When they come, Abu Basir says the same thing that Abu Jandal said. And he said, are you going to return me, O Messenger of Allah, after Allah has saved me? And he was told exactly what Abu Jandal was told, that Allah will make a way out for you. Allah will make a way out for you. So Abu Basir was handed back to these uh, two men. And uh, the story goes that when uh, Abu Basir uh, was with their company, he started chatting with them. He started becoming friendly with them, opening up their, you know, just uh, feeling comfortable and whatnot, psychological, you know, tactic. And then when they uh, sat down and they reached Dhul Hulayfa, which is literally 25 minutes outside for by drive, and those days could take an hour and a half to walk. So when they sit down and they start eating some dates, so the conversation has now become so open that Abu Basir starts praising one of the man's swords. I've never seen a sword this beautiful. This is an amazing sword. What have you done with it? Tell me. So he starts recounting, you know, a man's pride. I've done this and I've done that. You know, in our days, men talk about how big of a fish they caught with the fishing rod. Those days, they have some real stories about swords and what they've done, right? So he says, you know, I went in this battle and I did that battle and I killed this and I, you know, did that. Oh, you did this. Oh, great. Mashallah. You keep on making his ego bigger and bigger, right? By talking about his manly swordsmanship. And then Abu Basir says, let me see this legendary sword. It's an amazing sword. Let me, let me see it. And of course, naively, the man hands him the sword. Instantaneously, Abu Basir hands, chops off the man's head and turns to the other man to chop his head off. And the man just yells and screams and runs on his bare legs back to Medina. Right? And he races back to Medina and he makes it to Medina before Abu Basir himself makes it back to Medina. And the Prophet has barely handed over Abu Basir, probably an hour and a half, two hours has gone by, still sitting with the Sahaba, and this Qurashi who had come to take Abu Basir, he comes yelling and screaming into the masjid, tired, all disheveled, you know, because he's been running non-stop, right? Panting, and he is saying, that my companion has been killed, and I'm just about to be killed, so protect me. The guy just killed my other companion and now he's turning to me, so protect me. And uh, after a while, Abu Basir came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you have fulfilled your responsibilities. You returned them, uh, you returned me to them, but Allah allowed me to escape. Meaning, give me another chance now, right? Allah allowed me to escape. Now I can stay, right? And the Prophet ﷺ did not speak to him directly. He turned and he spoke into the air and he said, Wailu ummihi mis'aru harbin. This is a very poetic thing, it doesn't really translate into English, but it basically means woe to his mother, meaning, woe to his mother is an Arabic expression meaning uh, that he's going to not be living soon. Woe to his mother, yani he's not going to be alive too much. Mis'aru harbihi, what a great warrior he is. It translates like this What a great warrior he is, what a talented swordsman. If only he had someone else to help him. Meaning, I cannot help him. Right? Woe to his mother. This guy is lethal. He's dangerous. What a, what a great weaponry. What a great talented warrior he is. If only somebody could help him. Now by turning away, the indication is given. Before somebody else comes, you had better get out of my sight. Right? And this shows us the precision of the Prophet ﷺ, that look, it's not my job to put you in chains and take you back to the Quraysh. But you cannot live here because the treaty clearly says that nobody can live here if somebody comes to pick them up and now that you've killed this guy, they're going to come back again. And so the Prophet ﷺ hinted at him that look, I can't help you. So Abu Basir understood and he immediately fled from the masjid and ran, ran away. Because he understood now, now that the other, um, another party is going to come and you know the process is not going to give me a, a chance to be here. And so he ran away and he set up he uh, set up a small place to live in which was close to the city of Jeddah uh, but more on the shore, more northern, northern on the shore, sorry, southern on the shore, southern from Jeddah, uh, close to uh, Mecca. And in the meantime when he set it up there, he sent the message out that I'm over here. Abu Jandal heard that Abu Basir is setting up camp over there so Abu Jandal can escape and go down a little bit. He couldn't have gone all the way to Medina so he escapes and he meets with Abu Basir. So Abu Basir and Abu Jandal, the both of them, they meet up. 
and the news spreads that you can't go to Medina, O Muslim converts, come over to our new city. And so, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 70, 80 people eventually congregate. 80 people congregate. And they basically form a new camp and a new settlement. And what do you think they're going to do now that they're 80 strong? Attack the caravans of the Quraysh. Attack the caravans of the Quraysh. And they made it their livelihood. And wallahi, this is completely justified. You're not letting us live with you in peace. You're not letting us go to Medina in peace, right? You're not letting us do anything. Well, guess what? We are going to now attack back at you. And so, and, and notice here as well, by the way, subhanAllah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah said that there's going to be peace for 10 years, correct? But this group is not being allowed to sign a treaty with the Prophet ﷺ. By the orders of the Quraysh, correct? So they're not on the side of the Prophet ﷺ. So the treaty doesn't apply to them. And this is the intricacies of the own Quraysh. They're the ones doing this. And so the treaty doesn't apply to them. And therefore they make it their livelihood that every single caravan that goes uh, to Syria, that they would attack it. And situation became so bad because 70, 80 men is a strong contingent. And the caravans are long caravans of 70, 80, 90 camels. And you cannot protect a caravan you know, against a, a marauding band of 80 who are living in the desert. You don't know where they're going to attack from. It's very problematic. And so within uh, a year and a half, the Quraysh sent a delegation. Abu Sufyan sent a delegation to Medina, begging the Prophet ﷺ, by the rights of kinship, please take these 80 people and put them in Medina. Begging the Prophet ﷺ, if you truly are our blood, have some mercy on us and take these people and keep them with you in Medina. Get them away from that city. Get them away from their encampment and take them back to uh, Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ sent a messenger to Abu Basir and told him to bring all of your men back to uh, Medina. But alas, Abu Basir had suffered a wound or he was sick with one of the two riwayat. And he got the letter, but subhanAllah, he actually died because of his sickness before reaching Medina. So he was buried where that camp was, but the rest of the 70, 80, they came back to uh, Medina and they basically took up life with the Muslims. And here we have the one of the first signs of how the Treaty of Hudaybiyah would become a victory. One of the first signs we see here, what's happening here, that وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَكْرِينَ You cannot outwit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot. No matter what you think or what not, Allah Azza wa Jal is the best of all planners. And look at the infinite wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the pagans literally, literally they have to beg the Prophet to take the very people that they insisted not to take. They had to beg him to take him back. And this shows us in the end, Allah's uh, plan will always be the winning plan. Right? And the very Abu Jandal, who was the cause of all of this, is the one who led the camp back into Medina. Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail. Look, Allah's yani, perfection. Right? The very person who basically set it all off, Abu Jandal is the one who led the, the, the camp back into Medina. Also, before we go on here, like one of the most amazing lessons of this incident, which is commonly overlooked, is the the Iman of Abu Jandal in particular and then Abu Basir. I cannot think of a test that is more traumatic or difficult than to be rejected by, for political protection by the very Prophet that you believe in Wasallam. Think about that test. To go right to the camp of the Muslims and to see the Prophet ﷺ right there. And you really think, Khalas, that's it man, I've made it. Three years I've been tortured, now here I am. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells you, Sorry, I can't. Go back. Can you imagine the Iman, how it must have been shaken to the core? And yet, still, Iman wins. 
May Allah protect me and you. Wallahi, we get into the most minor issue. We start thou doubting. What's wrong? Get into a car accident. Get into some minor loss of money. And our iman is shaken. Look at how weak our iman is. Now put yourselves in the shoes of Abu Jandal. The very messenger that he believes in tells him, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. Go back. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Abu Jandal shows us what he did. He remained firm. And what happens? SubhanAllah. Out of nowhere. Allah's help here, Allah's izza from there. And you return back leading an entire envoy, an entire caravan, an entire group of Muslims with lots of money and ghanima from the Quraysh. You're the leader, you're now the, 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 the person of honor, the warrior of honor, you're now the soldier of honor. And you come back into Medina. SubhanAllah. He who puts his trust in Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will fulfill that trust. وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا And Abu Basir shows that, Abu Jandal shows that, Abu Basir as well. Twice he comes to Medina. And still the Prophet says, Woe to your mother, what a great warrior, I can't help you. And he has to flee. He doesn't even know where he's going. Put yourselves in the shoes of Abu Basir now. He can't go back to Mecca. He can't go back to Medina. What's he going to do? Every city has a treaty, either with the Quraysh or with the Muslims, right? That's Hudaybiyah, right? There is no neutral land. What does he do? He founds his own country, basically. And I'm just exaggerating country, but you get my point. His own political entity now. One person. But, and can you imagine, how long was he like this? How did he live? We don't know the stories. Who's going to record that for us, right? But put yourselves in that shoes. Imagine his loneliness. No wife, no family, no society. But then, somebody else hears. That's Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal comes. These two are already legends in the convert community who cannot immigrate. Khalas, you got both of the legends in one place instantaneously. One, two, three, four, ten, twenty, two dozen, three dozen, and seventy, eighty. Look now. And this is what happens when you have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You truly believe Allah azza wa will take care of things, Allah will take care of them. And we see this in the iman of Abu Basir and the iman of Abu Jandal. Now, after Abu Basir, Another immigrant came. Another immigrant came. But this one was far more problematic. Because the name of this immigrant was Umm Kulthum binti Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it, we've already done him in the past. He's one of the seven who were around the camels, uh, the, the one who threw the camel on the Prophet This is Uqba ibn Abi Mu'it, right? He had a daughter, Umm Kulthum. Umm Kulthum embraces Islam. At this stage, around this time, she embraces Islam. And she flees persecution. And she finds her way to Medina. Now, this is very sensitive. It's one thing to return a man to be tortured. To return a woman? That's very painful, as every one of us understands here. It's very painful. And even the Prophet did not know what to do now. Should we return her? What are we going to do? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina verse 10. Allah revealed Surah Al-Mumtahina verse 10. And it says that Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu That O oh, you who believe Ida ja'akal mu'minatu muhajiratin famtahinuhun If believing women come to you Then test them. Make sure that they are coming for the sake of religion. They're genuine converts, right? And if you find them to be genuine then, فَلَا تَرْجِعُهُنَّ إِلَى الْكُفَّارِ Don't return them to the kuffar. لَا هُنَّ حِلُّ لَهُمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحِلُّونَ لَهُنْ Neither are they halal for these women as spouses, nor are these women halal for them. But you must return the mahar of every one of their husbands, you have to return it. Because that's not fair that she takes the mahar and comes, she has to return the mahar. And then Allah says, after the idda is over, if you wish to marry, then you may marry them. And this Umm Kulthum, uh, she was married to Zayd uh, ibn Haritha. Zayd ibn Haritha, the quote unquote adopted son, she was married to Zayd ibn Haritha. Uh, and so Allah Azza wa Jal said that any mahar that has that they have done, you return it back to them. And then after they have their idda finished, then you can marry them. Now, why was it allowed to? Uh, have the women stay because once again the process is following the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. It was Suhail who said that لا يأتي منا رجل 
No man shall come to us that follows your faith except that you shall return that man to us. Now it is understood and that is the spirit of the law that when you say man, you mean person. It's understood that when you say man, it applies to a person. Right? That's how most treaties are written. Well, most treaties before lawyers were invented, but you know, lawyers change everything now. But that's how, you know, you, you, you write generically. And so he basically, and, and no doubt the majority of the muhajirs were men. And when you're writing this, what is in mind is a man coming. So the treaty, the spirit of it, no doubt includes women as well. That's the point. But it doesn't say so. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, look, you didn't agree to women basically. You agreed to men. And it literally says in the treaty, لا minna rajul. It says rajul. The treaty, the, what they wrote down, no man shall come to us, except that, shall come to you, except that you should return to him. And it doesn't say women. And so Allah Azza wa Jal made the qada, He made the decree that it will not apply to women. And therefore, women were allowed to immigrate, but not men. And subhanAllah, once again, Allah Azza wa Jal's plan came into effect. That it was not on the minds of either parties. But... Alhamdulillah, women were given the exception because as we understand, okay, it's tough enough for a man. How about a woman being tortured and persecuted, right? We're not going to stand for that. And it was not a part of the treaty. And so they were allowed to emigrate. And one more thing that we'll mention, uh, and then uh, we'll break, and then inshallah, next, uh, next Wednesday, we'll talk about all of the benefits of Hudaybiyah and Surah Al-Fatah, and then also move on, inshallah ta'ala. One final incident occurred on the way back uh, from Hudaybiyah and as we said they spent around 20 days camped at Hudaybiyah and then they spent another week and a half 10 days going back and forth so a total of six weeks they spent away from Medina uh, and on the way back that famous incident occurred where after a long day of heavy marching all day they've been marching uh, and they march all the way late into the night and it was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to march as much as he could at night time he liked to march at night as well because uh, he said that there's a hadith that says that land shortens at night and the meaning is that you actually are able to travel more at night anybody who has driven at night and driven in the day you actually end up stopping a lot more in the day and things happen in the day whereas at night if you manage to stay awake you mashallah drive non-stop and it goes much more uh, not that I'm encouraging you to drive at night if you get sleepy but I'm just saying for those who are used to long drives then driving at night has its benefits and our process of them would like to travel at the night time so he's traveling as much as they can until finally when everybody is exhausted and tired they get off of the side of the road and they camp and uh, he says who shall stay awake and protect us and guard us and then wake us up for Fajr and Bilal volunteers that I'll be the guard and I'll be the protector and I will be the alarm clock and Mu'adhin for Fajr but everybody is dead tired and as we know the famous story that uh, the first to wake up was either Abu Bakr or Umar when they felt the rays of the sun on them and this means this is around 7, 8 o'clock in the morning Imagine how tired for a group that never ever sleeps beyond the break of dawn. Not just because of Fajr, because of their livelihood. That's when people are programmed to wake up, is at the crack of dawn, right? Can you imagine the entire 1400, not a single one woke up until around maybe 8 o'clock when the heat of the sun gets to them. How tired they must be of this whole trip, right? Physically exhausted. And they start, uh, Abu Bakr or Umar starts saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Uh, because subhanAllah, they never had the audacity to shake the process of Astaghfirullah. Right? They're not going to say, wake up Ya Rasulullah. So how do they wake him up? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. By saying Allahu Akbar. And then uh, the Prophet ﷺ woke up and lo and behold, Bilal is still asleep. <laughs> right? They all surround Bilal and he's still asleep. Obviously, he tried his best. And he was the last to fall asleep, so he's going to be the last to wake up. So he wakes up and he finds everybody staring at him, right? And so he said, Ya Rasulullah, I tried, but, 
you know, the, the, the one who took my soul took my soul. I mean, it's, you know, I tried to stay awake, but I, I wasn't able to. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, let us get away from this place uh, because, you know, shaitan has caused us to miss Fajr. So let's go a little bit further. And then they prayed Fajr a little bit further. And uh, now here's a bit of a controversy. Did this incident happen twice or once? Because there are other versions that mention this incident after uh, another battle which we'll talk about and some riwayat mention it happened after the battle of Hudaybiyah or oh, not the battle after the incident of Hudaybiyah some riwayat mention it came on the incident of Hudaybiyah and other riwayat mention other things so scholars have differed that did this happen twice in the life of the Prophet or it only happened once and frankly it's very difficult to say for certain uh, Allah knows best maybe it happened twice Maybe it happened uh, only at this time and then the other version uh, is a mistake. Or maybe it happened at that version and this version that mentions Hudaybiyah is a mistake. Nonetheless, what we learn from this is that, subhanAllah, the only salah of the Prophet ever to have been missed by oversleeping is Fajr. Now we have already covered in the battle of Khandaq, Salat al-Asr was delayed one time because of the volleys and the arrows coming in, and Allah had not yet revealed Salat al-Khawf. Salat al-Khawf had not yet come down. Salat al-Khawf came down in, this, in the next few months. We talked about this, right? Salat al-Khawf came down after Khandaq. And so in Khandaq, they delayed Asr, not out of laziness, but out of war. And the process they made dua against them, and he made Asr up before he prayed Maghrib, and from this, Allah Azza allowed us the basic fiqh, which is whenever you miss a salah, you need to make up the missed salah before the current salah. So for whatever reason, now obviously for the Prophet he had the best reason in the world. There is no salat al-khawf, salat al-jihad, and he is in the middle of the war. He has not one minute to spare to go in and pray. So if for whatever reason, and in our case it's almost always laziness or forgetfulness, may Allah forgive us, if for whatever reason we don't pray, what are we supposed to do? We make up the first prayer, then we pray the current prayer. Right? Now in this incident, it is no doubt another blessing in disguise because no matter how righteous and pious we are, the one salah that humanity oversleeps once every while, we hope the process of once in a lifetime, or maybe max twice in a lifetime. If it happened twice, it happened twice. There is no three, right? Or maybe it's one time. So in the entire 23 years of the Prophet ﷺ, maybe once, maybe twice max. And both of them, not when he's home. Never once did he miss Fajr at home. On both occasions, or they might be the same occasion, he's missing them after something like this. This long day, camping, and then... You know, it's uh, oversleeping. And in this, there is just a little bit of a consolation for us as well. That it is human, once in a blue moon, to accidentally miss Fajr. Now, of course, for us, wallahi, there is no comparison. Yeah, and we're sleeping in our beds, we have alarm clocks, we have this and that. Look at the process and his situation and scenario. But my point being, if Allah wanted to, he would never have missed Fajr. Correct? If Allah wanted to, he would not have missed Fajr. Jibreel would, Jibreel would have come down and woke him up. Right? But there is a wisdom here. And that wisdom is all of us, we, this, the best of us, it doesn't matter, right? The best of us, once every while, yeah, and it just happens that the alarm clock does not go off, you're st you know, you, you do whatever, legitimate reason. And this is a demonstration for us that if it happens beyond our control, we didn't intend it, then inshaAllah ta'ala, we just pray it as soon as we're able to. Now as for the Prophet sallallahu uh, he felt that the area itself was not good because shaitan caused Bilal and shaitan caused the people to fall asleep. And so he wanted to get out of that area. Uh, and so that's a special ruling. As for us in our houses, obviously, that's nothing we can do. We will pray in our houses. But this clearly shows us the sunnah of what to do when you miss a prayer and you wake up late and that is you pray it as soon as possible and inshallah next week we'll talk about uh, at least 30 benefits that we can derive from the incident of Hudaybiyah uh, if not more and also we'll go over quickly uh, Surah Al-Fatah and then inshallah mention uh, some other incidents that took place right after the treaty of Hudaybiyah